Good morning, everybody. If you're in a uh, relatively local time zone or a uh, good day if you're somewhere else. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, the PostNL use case and how they scale to 100 million messages uh, per day. Um, but first, um, these are your presenters today. Um, my name is Jeroen van Disseldorp. Uh, we'll, I'll be doing this session together with Guy Hagemans and Mendot Leinenburg, and they will introduce themselves as they uh, start their own part of the presentation. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, uh, three different uh, subjects. Uh, first of all, a bit of an introduction into um, uh, data streaming, uh, particularly how that relates to uh, APIs and batch processing. Then we'll dive more in detail into the PostNL case uh, with a demo that illustrates how PostNL has solved uh, their streaming issues. My name is Jeroen van Disseldorp. I'm founder and uh, CEO of Actual. Um, and I will do the first section talking about data streaming. Um, so if you look at uh, the way that companies do uh, data integration nowadays, there's uh, three basic patterns um, in order to do a data logistics, right? to, to how, how to push data around between different applications. Um, and I'm comparing them in this slide to uh, parts of the human body in order to uh, make this a bit of a CEO boardroom uh, uh, level uh, understandable. So let's look at uh, how data integration can, can take place. Uh, first of all, we have a batch processing, which is really comparable to uh, your digestive system, uh, because typically you eat uh, three times a day. Uh, you do that at regular intervals, regular times. Um, when it's uh, 3.30 in the afternoon, you tend to wait until 5.30 or 6 o'clock when you're at home with your family at the dinner table. So there's something of a time aspect to how uh, how you eat and how you schedule your daily routines. And it's the same thing with batch processing. Uh, when you push data around in terms of files or large data sets, usually there's like a, uh, an arrangement that data comes in at a certain moment of the day or a certain time of the hour. Um, and you expect that as a receiver. Uh, so you'll be uh, probably scheduling your uh, processing time uh, after well, a certain period uh, and making sure that the probably lengthy and but predictable processing is uh, scheduled uh, right after you receive those uh, files or data sets. Um, this is uh, uh, typically done an, an just a few times a day and, and not really comparable to um, how you do APIs. Um, because if you do APIs, or what we used to call that service-oriented architecture, RPC, or web services, or it has, it has had many different names, but it's typically request and reply. Um, and it's really comparable to how your brains tell your muscles to contract or relax. Um, your muscles would be the servers in this case, uh, the lots of uh, individual commands being transmitted uh, between uh, the, the, the brain and every individual muscles. So there's typically two involved parties in a request reply pattern uh, and your brains have a specific intent because they want to get something done. They want you to start moving or they want you to open your eyes. Anything that um, it wants to get done, it has to send individual commands for to your muscles uh, to start moving. Um, that is still a completely different pattern from how we do event streaming nowadays because event streaming is more comparable to your nervous system uh, so think of your skin or your taste buds or your eyes uh, taking up all kinds of signals from the outside world. And they put that as individual signals, uh, notifications uh, on your nervous system to be picked up on by different parts of the brain. And in your brain, you have contextual processing going on. So, um, well, there's some sort of an anomaly detection. You see whether you can use a certain signal or not. Does it fall outside of the expected boundaries or not? And if it does, you'll probably handle it differently than um, when it's just something that you would expect to be happening at that point in time. And just to, for uh, as a simple example, uh, you're mostly sitting down probably now. But uh, if I tell you that uh, you're sitting down, you all of a sudden start to feel the pressure that you exert on your chair. Whereas you know two seconds ago, you weren't even aware of that. So context uh, really does uh, affect the processing. Uh, typically, it's all kinds of inde inter independent systems uh, that do this processing. Um, so if a system joins or um, decides to not join anymore, uh, the rest of the whole system does continue as it did before. Um, so 
how does this work with uh, um, well data orientation or command orientation? Typically, the, the middle one here is command oriented. So when I uh, send somebody an API call, um, I typically ask or well tell uh, the server to do something for me. Whereas the first one and the last one is more data oriented. Here's your data and, and you decide what you want to do with that. Uh, typically, all three are part of modern data architectures. Uh, we'll be focusing mostly on, on the latter. Uh, and of course, that has been the, the major trend of the past years uh, to implement something with event-driven architecture. But sometimes I also get the question, you know, what, what if we were to move everything on, on data warehouse to event streaming, is that possible? Well, the analogy here uh, really helps because if you lose one of these systems, you basically die. And that's what we also see in organizations. Um, well, if you... Uh, have to do formal reporting to um, uh, to regulators or to somebody else. Uh, you'll probably mostly use uh, data warehouses or a better type of processing. If you want to get something done, it's more APIs. And if you want to notify something uh, to well, the outside world or basically broadcast something, uh, event streaming is more appropriate. Um, so let's look at, at different kinds of uh, use cases uh, for data streaming, and I'll quickly uh, go over this, but just to give you an indication of where data streaming is being used nowadays. Uh, first area is everything that has to do with customer or customer service. Uh, customers give you signals all uh, throughout the day. They visit your websites, they interact with your apps, uh, they have all kinds of uh, products that they're interested in and every signal that you can get from the customer helps you to build up the 360 customer view. Uh, so typically uh, uh, systems would notify about customer signals and a customer profiling application could build up the 360 customer view. Uh, also think of real-time alerting, smart assistance, anything that you can use the customer signals for in order to help them better at a later point in time is uh, definitely an area where streaming is uh, really successful. Uh, another one is around ecosystem integration. So where different parties decide to work together around the common business process. Um, I think of, well, harbors like Rotterdam Harbor or uh, uh, airports where you have a lot of different companies, logistics companies, uh, um, uh, transportation companies, uh, all kinds of coordination companies working around a common business process. But where we have these four airlines today, uh, tomorrow, two of them are bankrupt and through three new ones can arise. Uh, it would be really easy for them to uh, pick up on the business process by connecting to uh, the central event streaming platform uh, and participating in all of the coordination that goes on there. Also think of non-competitive sectors like uh, municipalities. If you move between different cities, uh, they probably have to coordinate your address and your, your data to be moved from one municipality to another. Um, and the same thing is also internally in organizations where backend systems are integrating with uh, front-end systems through event streaming platforms. A third area where you see a lot of uh, data streaming going on is around, uh, uh, well, speeding up uh, processes, going from batch processing to uh, continuous batches of one, which uh, uh, typically describes uh, streaming. Um, think of real-time dashboards, uh, so you don't wait uh, until 12 o'clock to get new data in to fill your new dashboard for the next hour, but you want, you want to get all kinds of different signals throughout uh, the hour to be able to update your real-time dashboards with. Uh, same thing for fraud anomaly detection, a continuous data exchange with your business partners. That's all stuff that uh, used to happen in batch, uh, but now business just simply requires that it's uh, a more continuous flow of information. And of course, last but not least, uh, sensor data processing, which is also relating a little bit to the PostML use case coming up. Uh, but think of smart meters, smart grids, um, uh, railways, train stations, everything where you have a lot of sensor information collected that can be transmitted through a streaming platform to a central place where uh, it's being uh, uh, processed and, and put into dashboards or it builds up a common operational picture or in general, it gives you better situational awareness. All right, um, so that is all done on a streaming platform. So let's look at what a streaming platform typically looks like. Um, here you see a typical platform in the heart of an organization with all different departments of a typical organization around that. 
Um, and the platform in this case uh, provides or intends to provide a marketplace where you can exchange all of your business events. And of course, a business event is something that you have to define yourself. Um, for some organizations uh, in the financial sector, uh, loan status changes or uh, financial transactions could be uh, typical business events. In the post -NL case, as you'll see, um, a partial being scanned by a mailman is a typical business event that is put on uh, on the platform. And after that, you have three types of interactions. Um, you have producers of these events, uh, so applications that share data in business meaningful terminology. Uh, so you don't talk about event type three because the other party in, in your organization has to understand what event type three means. You typically write out those events. So a parcel status update would be more of a better description. Uh, so uh, anybody in the organization can understand what this event really means. Um, consumers, they subscribe to these events and they handle the messages as they come in. Um, and the category that does both, so that reads from one or more event streams and writes out to one or more other event streams. That's what you call streaming applications. Uh, and they, those typically do calculations, aggregations, joins. Um, and, and this is also the category that Guy and Mendelt will dive more in depth into uh, in a moment. Uh, so why is this model so important to have a central streaming platform? Um, well, typically because all organizations that share data by default, they tend to outperform their peers in the market that don't. Um, so data sharing has become a crucial uh, business capability uh, that you know companies are advised to adopt uh, because simply if you lock up data in stovepipes, you will definitely not perform as high as your um, peers in the market that do so. Uh, so that's been proven by research time and time again. So this model of having that central event streaming platform really aligns with uh, business goals. Uh, but then, of course, you do have to implement such a platform. Uh, and that can be a, a bit challenging uh, because nowadays uh, the front ends of organizations uh, is, are mostly oriented in, in DevOps kinds of teams. Uh, so every team is responsible for their own IT products, their own business products. Uh, their own markets, their own customers, their own market segments. Uh, but somehow you have to integrate them onto a common backend, uh, being the event platform in this case. Um, so we've experienced throughout the time that uh, there's typically three ways in which you can implement such a platform. The first one is to open up everything. Um, and this is initially how LinkedIn got going with Apache Kafka. Um, so they owned all the data within LinkedIn. Uh, there was no security built in. It was just a means of uh, sharing data between different applications. Um, no security, no uh, uh, certificates, no encryption. Uh, so basically, if you knew where to find Kafka on the network, you could participate in any kind of data exchange. Um, but of course, with modern data regulations, privacy regulations, this is completely not an option anymore. You have to shield your data, encrypt the data, and make sure it doesn't fall into the wrong hands. Um, the other way to implement a streaming platform to work for multiple DevOps teams is to authorize a central Kafka team. Uh, this is what we also used to do at Actual for several customers. Uh, we were that team, uh, being able to uh, configure the streaming platform and making sure that everybody can only act within certain guardrails. Um, and th then what you typically get is a situation in which you do the functional maintenance as a Kafka team. Um, so you get questions like, can you deploy this topic for us? Uh, can you change the schema on this particular topic? Uh, did my message arrive? Uh, everything that, well, development teams would be asking for uh, because they don't have visibility, they don't have control of the configuration. Um, that is what you can then expect. Of course, that's not the way that we wanted to go because uh, this gives uh, the situation that the central Kafka team really becomes a bottleneck in your organization. Um, so also a no-go. So the third way we decided to implement is to really implement uh, the whole streaming platform as a multi-tenant platform. Um, and in order to do that, we found out over time that you need uh, three crucial capabilities, uh, data governance, uh, making sure that everybody uh, in the organization has certain rights and, and has the uh, ability to do something. Um, well, if you have those rights, uh, then you need to be able to exercise them. And that is what self-service is meant for. 
So self-service is a way uh, where uh, users can log in and they can configure and define their own piece of the pie of the whole streaming platform. And last but not least, uh, if that works for everybody, of course, they should be able to rely on the security uh, so no data can fall into the wrong hands. Uh, and also, I won't be able to manipulate the topic or the application of my neighboring team. Uh, so that is something that, that needs to be guaranteed by the platform. All right, so uh, with that theory in, in the back of our minds, uh, I would like to hand it off to Guy uh, to talk more about the PostNL use case. Thank you.